This Working Scientist podcast series is sponsored by the University of Queensland, where research is addressing some of the world's most challenging and complex problems. Take your research further at UQ. Visit uq.edu.au. Hello, this is How to Save Humanity in 17 Goals, a podcast brought to you by Nature Careers in partnership with Nature Food. I am Juliana Gil, Chief Editor at Nature Food. Welcome again to the series where we meet the scientists working towards the Sustainable Development Goals agreed by the United Nations and world leaders in 2015. For almost a decade, in a huge global effort, Thousands of researchers have been using those targets to tackle the biggest problems that the planet faces today. In episode 5, we look at sustainable development goal number 5, how to achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls, and meet two female academics from the University of Melbourne, Australia, who were part of an affirmative action strategy that led to very striking outcomes. Hi, my name is Elaine Wong and I am Pro Vice Chancellor of People and Equity at the University of Melbourne, Australia. I previously held the position of Associate Dean Diversity and Inclusion at the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology at the University. Hi, uh, my name is Georgina Such. I'm an Associate Professor in the Faculty of Science, but I also have a passion for equity and inclusion, so that has led to roles as the Associate Dean of Diversity and Inclusion in the Faculty of Science but importantly for this conversation, also as the academic lead for gender equity, uh, and that involves work with the Athena Swan program. The affirmative action strategy employed at the University of both Melbourne was motivated by the underrepresentation of women in science, technology, engineering and mathematics, so STEM for short. And this is pervasive across many countries around the world. Now here at the University of Melbourne, we are actively addressing the underrepresentation of women in STEM and actually more broadly in other disciplines across the institution uh, in the higher education sector. What we have observed is that the progress to lifting female participation in our academic staff profile has been extremely slow uh, through open recruitment, and this includes all gender. And a new strategy was actually required to catalyze change, not only in the way we recruit it, but also a change in how we nurture and develop our staff. So this change came about in 2016, uh, initiated and spearheaded by the School of Mathematics and Statistics. The school advertised three continuing academic positions whereby only women applicants were eligible to apply. So further recruitment followed in the subsequent years in the School of Physics, School of Chemistry, and then the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology. And although there were some recruiting variations between the discipline campaigns, uh, the aims were always similar uh, to increase the number of women academic staff in the faculty or school, to add to the diversity of our staff profile, uh, to improve professional or professorial pipeline, uh, to provide female role models for our students, and uh, more importantly, to jumpstart a more inclusive and uh, nurturing culture. And if I could just add to that and just really highlight that there was really strong evidence of impact of this campaign. So if we take maths and stats as an example, we move from a ratio of 17% of women in that school when the program started in 2016 through to 2023, where we have got 30% uh, women in that school. And that is not just because of this targeted recruit program, recruitment program, but it acted, as Elaine said, like a catalyst. So this was sort of sparked off a you know, more inclusive culture within that school and also a different perception about how that school was perceived more uh, externally, which led to more diverse recruitment.
The Sustainable Development Goal number five is achieving gender equality and empower all women and girls. Now, the effects of women's underrepresentation in the work- workforce are deep and wide-ranging. Uh, not only is there a loss of opportunity for individual women in terms of agency, self-agency, but there are far-reaching consequences and losses uh, for the industry, for innovation, you know, for women's societal contributions. It is for these reasons that there has been a focus on targeted efforts and investments in addressing women's underrepresentation. And the affirmative recruitment strategy, together with a suite of complementary strategies, for example, those that Georgina will talk to in the Athena Swan Action Plan, we do this to tackle head-on the gender-related challenges pertaining to equal opportunities, to career participation, to career progression, and ultimately leadership at the faculty, at the school, and across the institution. So as Elaine was saying, the Athena Swan program is a really important pillar in our work on gender equity at the University of Melbourne. For those of you who don't know, the Athena Swan is an international framework for supporting the improvement of gender equity in the higher education and research sector. And in Australia, it's led by the Science in Australia Gender Equity or SAGE organisation. So as part of our work at the University of Melbourne, we started by having a look at our foundation data to really try and understand what our key barriers are for equal participation for women and gender diverse staff in our organisation. And we then started using that basis to frame a a suite of initiatives to support improvement in gender equity. And they really are in a few key areas, as we've talked about, recruitment, but also retention and career progression. So I am incredibly passionate about my career. I feel lucky every day to do what I do. I started my career in science very early, actually, because my family has a strong focus in science. My father is an industrial chemist, so he was always telling me what an engaging and exciting career science was. So I think I got my passion early, but uh, so when I can, I continued on in at the University of Melbourne to do my undergraduate degree, and I have actually never left. So I uh, I'm now an academic here, and my area of interest is in the design of uh, new ways of delivering drugs using smart delivery systems. But I'm lucky to be able to combine that with a passion for equity inclusion and working on new and innovative ways that we can um, improve our progression of our underrepresented groups in our community. And what I love about uh, my career is that you are always learning and we're always doing something different. So I think it keeps us young. So originally coming from a small mining town uh, in Malaysia called Ipoh, I graduated uh, from a PhD in electrical engineering here at the University of Melbourne. And so in addition to my leadership role at the university um, that uh, oversees equity as well as uh, people uh, inclusion, I'm also a professor at the Faculty of Engineering, uh, looking at uh, innovation and also uh, innovating communication technologies to better uh, provide digital connectivity between people, machines and things. So currently I'm working on innovating uh, haptic communications across large geographical areas so that we can realize immersive remote environments across the globe between people and people, people and machine. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to note uh, for this conversation uh, that, you know, for almost half of my career, I've uh, had to work on a part-time basis primarily due to carer duties and family responsibilities and because I am the primary carer of the family. And so you can say that, you know, I have an understanding um, of the gendered challenges faced by many of our colleagues, uh, including, you know, Georgie here, um, that uh, we are all in the same situation. (music) 
So the rationale for affirmative recruitment has always been clear across the schools and the faculties uh, that implemented the strategy. Uh, core to it is that despite widespread awareness of gender disparity in our staff profile, especially at the leadership level, the pace at which we were making progress was extremely slow. For the Faculty of Engineering, the female participation rates for undergraduate and masters by coursework and postgraduate degrees were actually above 35%, but we were not observing the same trends in our workforce at the faculty. So it was clearly evident based on the data that, you know, our continuing staff um, was really lagging behind. In fact, we were at 13% in 2003, and this rose only to about 16% in 2007. So if you think about it, it was only 3% increase in participation rate in 15 years. So our strategic intent with the recruitment was to address the gender imbalance across our continuing staff cohort, but at the same time, see the recruitment of our new faculty staff members to be an impetus for us to work on our own culture, one that we will support and progress our staff uh, through the pipeline. So an important part of our Sina Swan work is this retention and career progression piece. So as part of our initial work under the leadership of Merrilise Gulliam, we developed a career progression program, and that was based on career mentoring specifically for promotion. So we wanted to provide us a suite of initiatives to support our academics from moving from our middle career level through to more senior levels within the organisation. So that program has now been running for a number of years and shown really strong uh, impact on developing that pipeline through to senior levels of our academic workforce, which is really important because that is a key uh, tool for making sure that we've got more diverse leadership and thus the conversations are going to be really thinking about our, all our parts of our community rather than just a few parts of our community. So is it legal to offer an academic position only to a specific segment of the community? The answer is a resounding yes. Uh, in the state of Victoria, uh, where the University of Melbourne is situated, there exists a special measure under Section 12.1 of the 2010 Equal Opportunity Act that states a person may take a special measure for the purpose of promoting or realizing substantive equality for members of a group with a particular attribute. So what this means is for us at the university, we are seeking to build a diverse workforce that reflects the society we serve. And in particular, the representation of women in areas where they had been traditionally underrepresented. So STEM disciplines. And so we were basically covered by the Equal Opportunity Act. So the affirmative recruitment strategy was highly successful in capturing a wide and high caliber pool of national and international applicants. Uh, certainly for the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology, we received the highest number of applications in any round of recruitment, 402 applications for five positions. Now, the main feedback from applicants suggested that the female-only recruitment round sent a very strong signal to applicants, as Georgie was referring to before, uh, and that the faculty and the university support gender equity, diversity and inclusion. And this in turn encouraged many, many more applications in subsequent open rounds. Now, data from the Faculty of Engineering and Information Technology shows that in the 16 years prior to the faculty's 2018 recruitment, the female participation rate rose only by 3%. However, within a year of the recruitment, female participation rate rose by 4% to 20%. 
creating a momentum that has since further improved to 24% overall, the highest ever in the faculty. So this impact was also seen in the Faculty of Science. So as I mentioned earlier, in maths and stats, which was the first school to undergo targeted recruitment, we have transitioned from 17% in 2016 through to 30% in 2023. And that is a, a huge jump really for that school. Uh, another example is in the School of Chemistry, where we have gone from 19% through to 33% in 2023. When the idea of affirmative recruitment was initially floated, um, they were certainly concerned. Uh, and this wasn't because our colleagues didn't believe in the benefits of a more diverse workforce, but uh, for the following reasons. First, uh, the way in which we were addressing gender imbalance through affirmative recruitment seemed unfair or was seen as a form of uh, negative or reverse discrimination, especially by our junior male colleagues. Uh, second, there was a perception that the quality of the applicants would be compromised. And third, concerns arose about how successful the applicants would be treated by their colleagues. And so these concerns raised um, actually by both male and female colleagues were alleviated um, through a combination of actions and response. Uh, it was critical that the com campaigns that we had received an overt demonstration of support from both the dean, the senior leadership, and all other leaders within the faculty and the schools. And this lent to a voice in which they could openly discuss uh, issues with uh, those that had concerns with the recruitment. And whenever opportunity presented itself, uh, data was used to highlight the lack of progress over a long period. And this was harnessed continuously to improve understanding for the need for the affirmative action. It was also important for us to communicate that the recruitment would not be perpetual, uh, but rather intended as a jumpstart to transform uh, workforce into a more diverse one and whereby culture would change to a more nurturing one. Uh, we also acknowledge that affirmative recruitment is also part of a suite of strategies as Georgie alerted to before, and we need to design uh, in, an inclusive culture with initiatives that enables uh, all faculty members to progress in their careers. I just wanted to add that I think the impact of this program and the support for it across the university has really grown as a result of seeing the success of the targeted recruitment candidates as they've progressed through their careers. So we have a number who've been award winners. And they've, we've also seen indirect effects as well by building a more diverse uh, network of collaborators for the university and also student cohorts as well. So people wanting to engage with these new uh, members of our community. Ultimately, the goals of the university as articulated through our diversity and inclusion strategy are to build trust um, that, you know, we are the leader of diversity inclusion, uh, both internally as well as externally to our internal stakeholders and external stakeholders. We want to build a diverse community that reflects the diversity of the broader society that we serve. Uh, we want to build a culture of belonging where everyone is welcome, they're safe and they feel that they belong. And uh, ultimately, diversity inclusion is embedded in all our systems, our processes, and our work. And so by 2030, uh, our vision is to create a university community that is thriving, that is fair, that is diverse, working together respectfully uh, to make a difference to each other and in the world through our research, our teaching, and through our engagement. Thanks for listening to this series, How to Save Humanity in 17 Goals. Join us again next week when we look at Sustainable Development Goal number 6, 
How to achieve availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. See you then! This Working Scientist podcast series is sponsored by the University of Queensland, where research is addressing some of the world's most challenging and complex problems. Take your research further at UQ. Visit uq.edu.au.